Welcome to Now Church. We are about to begin. Please take this opportunity to pull out your smartphone so you can like, share, and check in on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please use the hashtag Now Church. Thank you, and enjoy today's service. shout this morning. Come on, let's do it. Woo! Come on. Put your hands together. Hey. The work has already been finished. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Sing it out. You know it, right? Everything that I'll ever need. Calvary. 
sing it out. You build Say. Sing it over your life, yeah. When we buy, yeah. Oh, and Jesus. Oh, what a beautiful sound. What a beautiful sound. The church declaring who God is. The church declaring the truth of his word. And what we bind on earth is bound in heaven. And what we lose, God. So today we lose your freedom, your joy. We lose freedom and victory. We lose faith. Come on, we lose the provision of God. We release, oh God, hope and expectation. Oh, thank you, God. But these aren't just nice songs that we sing, but it's declaration of your word. I think we need to do it one last time. Say, upon this rock. You built your church oh. and the gates of hell will not leave No matter what you're facing, yeah, when we buy faithful are you God you know Pastor Chris was back there if you serve in the house then uh, you understand that we have huddles before every service and um, Pastor Chris was just encouraging us as a team of people who have been here they were here early and getting ready for you to make this experience awesome but he was just reflecting on some of the different things that have happened through the 30 something years and he had a show of hands of which ones had been here certain amounts of time and I just looked around and I just thought thank God for the faithfulness of who he is and thank God for your faithfulness come on and then he was also reflecting to pre-PL days <laughs> when they did worship with CDs and cassette tapes I was like woo glad I wasn't here then <laughs> pre me but I just am so privileged and honored to be able to lead you guys into the presence of God. So thankful that we get to do this. So thankful. We are worshiping church. Has God been good to anybody in this room besides you? Has he been faithful to anybody? Because all my life you have been faithful. If you know it, sing it out. Come on. Sing all my yeah church I will sing of the goodness of God yeah I love you Lord oh your mercy never fails me in all my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God And I declare that all my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God Tell him I love your voice I love your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are cold like no other I know you as a father I know you as a friend 
for the next 32 years, we need his presence. Come on, let your worship, let your worship. All I have needed, your hand, you have provided, God. You keep providing, God. You never leave us, you never forsake us. Ask you a lot, but last time, all the way up to the sky. Come on, lift them up and tell them all my life seem to you. All my life I've been vain. something so rich in this house right now do you feel it in this place in this moment and I just reflecting again we're we're reflective because today is our 32nd anniversary of now church come on and 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 you know what we're excited about is we're not we don't only celebrate where we've been we're celebrating where we're going and, and let me just tell you if this is a newer experience for you for now church as you're coming in here you may see some people around you that are celebrating, and, and it's hard to read where they're from because right now, as we're worshiping God and we're saying, all my life you've been faithful. And it's so rich. And some of you, that faithfulness is like what God did just last week. And that's your fresh, maybe it's a new walk of faith in your life, and this is just something that God has just shown up this year. And you may be standing beside somebody that, that has, they're celebrating faithfulness of God over decades. Decades. And so there's something rich in this house of now church. Let me just give you just, just a little prophetic unction, a little something. There's something rich in now church of, of proven faithfulness and walk with God. And he's been faithful to us as we've been faithful to him. And he's established something strong that as you come in and you find your place here, you can't help but grow and mature and respond. It's a healthy, wholesome environment in the spirit of God because this place is full of testimonies of lives changed. And God worship fully and completely. Come on. He is good. He is good. He is good. Oh, he is good. So yes, so just one more time, one more time. We are asking you to raise your hands a lot today. One more time, let's just lift up your hands in simple thanksgiving and gratitude to our God. And Lord, we celebrate you today, 32 years. Oh my God, 32 years is so much. You've shown yourself faithful. You've showed up, Lord, on time. You blessed us, and it's what you said. You do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think so many times. So many times, so many blessings, so many healed bodies. Lord, so many restored marriages. So many marriages found here. Lord, so many children being birthed healthy, whole here in this church. Lord, so many messages that came forth from the throne of heaven and changed lives. So many worship experiences where you showed up and you did amazing things. Jesus, we're just so grateful. Jesus, we give you all of our gratitude, all of our heart, all of our life. And we just dedicate from this point on, Lord, continuing to be now church for you representing you in the earth what an honor what a privilege and we give you praise lord for what you're doing in jesus name amen come on let's give god praise 
Yeah, come on, yes, yes, yes. He is so good. Wow, I'm sorry, I gotta compose myself a little bit here. <laughs> you know, because we have so much to celebrate here. We really do. There's just so many things happening. And, uh, and, and that's a good segue right into In the Know, because again, we have so many things that uh, we don't highlight because, well, we try to highlight everything because so much happens. We want to catch you up on everything. So one of the things that happened during Easter, and we didn't get a chance to announce it, was we have a drop-off area outside while we're under construction. If you've seen that, show the picture if you will, you see a place where you can pull up and park. This is going to be for you, for especially for rainy days. If you want to drop off there, we're going to have some people out there with umbrellas to help you to get you as close as we can to the entrance. Of course, we still have courtesy cart running to help you out there, but that's going to be a drop off. You can use that drop off even on sunny days. You can drive up there and drop off right there. And again, this is just going to be during our construction time. We just want to make sure that your experience with Now Church is everything it can be, even in the midst of construction, right? So anyway, so we're doing that, and so that's awesome. And then another thing that we have going on this last week, we had a Parents Connect. It was a great time where we had all the parents come together, and we had Pastor Richard, Pastor Gail, Pastor Tristan, Pastor Kristen. They were up here and partnering and helping help our parents to know how to raise kids in this environment and this culture. And I feel like that is so strategic in this time for the church to answer a very specific need and helping parents to, to navigate in this time. And it was a tremendous time. And it's going to be the first to probably many things of gathering together. So it was a tremendous time. We loved it. So let me just hear it. Parents, you guys, you enjoyed it? Yeah, it was good. Yeah, so that's awesome. So we're going to be doing those things again and again. So if you are newer to Now Church, I want to make sure that you feel welcome. If you didn't stop by the welcome tent or the welcome center out front, you'll see a cart out there with welcome. Please go by there because they have some gifts for you just to celebrate you and thank you for coming. And also, we always put out a three-week challenge. It's check out Now Church three weeks in a row and see what God does. Listen, decades, decades of fulfilling commitment in Now Church. It starts with just one week, two weeks, three weeks. And the next thing you know, God's speaking to your life and he's saying, this is your tribe. This is your people. This is your family. And you need to grow with them because they're going somewhere. So we're glad that you are here at Now Church. I want you to look around, look around, bring up the lights for a second, find some people that just, I mean, everybody around are smiling. Look how happy they are. Go out of your way and welcome them to Now Church. You can take a seat and we're going to continue on. What a nice place to be in now, church, huh? Hey, listen, we're glad, again, we say this over and over, we're so glad that you're here. And, and here's the thing, when you've been at Now Church for a while, it is awesome, we're so glad you're here, but we always, always, always welcome everyone coming in for the first day the first time, the first experience that you have. And so we are, we are always trying to remember, we have people that are, that are joining in this marathon with this of life. They're joining in on this lap, right? You're wondering why am I still up here? That's probably you're wondering why I'm still up here. Okay, so <laughs> uh, ushers are going to help and assist right now with offering, but I want to lay down some foundations of some things that maybe you, not, you, you may have not heard. Uh, some things that maybe you have not uh, seen in the Word. And so I have a great verse that some of you, you've heard this many years because you've been walking with God, and maybe you're actively walking in this truth. Some of you, this is a new truth that you haven't walked in yet, applied it to your life. But it's in Malachi 3, verse 10. Okay? And as we put it up there, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house. Say food. food. How many like food? Some of you don't like food. How many like food? <laughs> food is a good thing. Food is a good thing. You need food. You need, you need food, sustenance. You need something to give your body energy. Guess what? God says that we need to bring our tithe into the storehouse, that there would be food in, in that house, in that place. And so here's a principle that God has set in order of how the kingdom of God operates. He calls it tithe. Tithe is the first 10% of your income. Here is what we teach at this 
well, in our liftoff groups, when we're gathering together as new groups, we teach this principle. But it's something that God set in order because he wants you to see what tithe is. He says, he says of tithes that it's holy and it's mine. That's what God says. It's holy and it's his. But he entrusts you with that in your paycheck to, to see your obedience. And he draws you into operating in a spiritual principle. But here's the thought I want to bring about today. With the tithe, you bring the tithe that there may be food in the house. This thing exploded in my spirit in realizing we're celebrating 32 years here. And I stepped back. Come on, yeah, that's good. I stepped back and I realized, why is my heart so full? With 32 years, it hasn't been just the experience of 32 years. That's awesome. But I realize that God has taught me a principle in this word to invest in this house so that there would be meat, food for my family. And, and every time I gave over the years, every time, every time I was investing, every time I was investing in this place, that there would be enough supply that a powerful word would be preached, that children's ministry would be strong, that worship team would be well equipped with everything technical and sound, and, and, and that AC would be blowing, and everything that makes this experience everything it can be. I was investing in that, and I was drawing the benefits of it because there's food in the house. And when I come, I know there's food here. When I come, I know there's going to be something here that's going to change my life and change my family. I've invested. I'm looking around at some of you realize maybe you're here first time. That's cool. Look, well, I've invested for you to be here. <laughs> but I've invested for my life and my family, man. <laughs> I've invested so much here. I don't even know, have no clue how much tithe and offering has flowed through my life to this place. But I know I've invested my life here. And you know what's so good? It's all the reward and benefit. It's a rich experience for me because I'm so deeply invested. I want that for you. We want that for you. That's what tithe, one of the aspects of tithe is all. God wants this experience for you where you come into a church and you're not like attending church or it's a good church to go to, but when you show up at now church, this is my church. Why is it my church? Because I'm invested. I'm a vested member here. Amen? Is that good? So right now, if you're ready to give, you have something ready, you can invest in different ways. We have, listen, we still receive cash and checks. Yes, we do. Remember checks, things you write out, yes. But we also do this online. That's why we have these I gave cards because we want you not only just to set things sometimes automatically, but don't be automatic just in your faith. We want you to be able to give in this moment too, to give the action of saying, I invest. I invest. This is your tithe, Lord. It's holy. I give it into the kingdom, right? Are you ready? Come on up here, ushers. Be ready. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the opportunity. Lord, and we invest in your kingdom. You wanted our heart in this, and you wanted our finances in this. And it's your tithe. It's not even ours. You said it's yours, but you entrust us to bring it to the storehouse. And Lord, we bring it now and we thank you that we are investing in something. Lord, even in now church, 32 years, but how many more years that we're enabling your presence to be known, your messages to be heard, your worship to be sung here in this house. We invest in all of that and lives touched in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's go ahead and give. Happy anniversary, everybody. 32 years. feel like we're really grown up now. Uh, 32 years ago, my wife and I came here just with an expectation. For those of you who don't know the history, I'll just tell you real briefly. We started in a little warehouse three miles further south down toward Bellevue, right next to the Quick King down there. Our first offices were the 
what is now um, Papa John's Pizza. That was our office uh, back then. In fact, we had it before they did. It was brand new. And uh, we had a little piece of land we were renting back there. Uh, it had been a formerly a lawnmower shop before it was a church. And we didn't find out until a couple of years in, I just remembered this recently, we didn't find out until a couple of years in that the guy uh, that was, was renting it to us was in deep tax trouble. And he was trying to put a church in so they wouldn't repossess it from him. So we had favor. <clears throat> we did really well. It worked, worked good for us. But it was interesting because then he was trying to kind of mess us around with the building and maybe try to sell it to us. But this was, it was all shady. This is the point. But God gave us there in humble beginnings. We started with, a, <clears throat> with one room that was air conditioned, one little office, and the, and the rest of the, where the kids were was an un air conditioned warehouse. So we asked people to bring your kids in shorts and t-shirts and we put as many fans as we could in that place till we could have faith to do something more. So um, the, uh, I had one thing, so, some of you know that my, my claim to fame in life besides being Gil Parent Chief's husband <laughs> and Ricky and Kristen's father, uh, my big claim to fame was I was the youth pastor for Benny Hinn back in the heyday in Orlando. Some people, some people still get blown away by that. Oh, and other people coming in now don't even know who Benny Hinn is. But it was, it, that church down in Orlando was a, it was an internationally known revival center. And we were there from 19, late uh, December 86 until 1990, May 1st, 1990, when we started the church, they sent us out to come up here. And part of what they did was they blessed us with this office furniture, including one of Benny Hinn's executive chairs was my chair, my office chair. And so we had no nursery. We used, the, we used my office as the nursery. We call it the nerfus. <laughs> uh, it was an office nursery. And we, were, we did okay the first few months in that summer until uh, one day a kid decided to christen my chair <laughs> with his pee. When he did that, it destroyed that nice executive chair and I suddenly had faith to build a nursery. <laughs> and within a few weeks, we had a little nursery off the back of it and had air conditioned that. And it was, anyway, it was just, you know, uh, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And so every step of the way, it's been a faith work. It's been a labor of love. When my wife and I came up here, we were just 19 years old and Okay, we were 19. <clears throat> we were 29 years old, 32 years ago, and we just came full of, full of raw, what I call raw faith. Raw faith is that you don't know all the stuff that you're going to go through. And I'm so thankful God didn't tell us what we would go through the first year because it was, it was really tough. I mean, 10 months in, we had a threat of a church split. Uh, and it was just agonizing. It just was, oh, it just, I died a thousand deaths. But when that thing happened, um, people uh, said, well, that's, that's, our, that's our nursery equipment, and that's our, uh, those were our chairs, and that's our sound system. So I said, take it. You just can't touch the people. And so somebody cleaned out all the stuff and I said, okay, God, we got a building and we got 100 people. Whatever you want to do. I think we we're up to about 140 by that point. We got a building, we got 140 people left. What do you want to do? Because I said at that point, I didn't really sign up for this. <laughs> I could really go back in the insurance business anytime you want. This is hard. And within three weeks, People that were here will tell you the story. Within three weeks, we had all brand new sound equipment, all brand new chairs, and everything was paid for in cash. Amen. By miracles of God, it was paid for. <clears throat> At that moment, we knew God was with us. Like we knew before, but we knew that we knew because of God's provision at that point. 
because we really were this close to just closing the doors, but we, but we committed to be here. And over the years, people have tried to get me to take churches in Orlando, take, church, take a church in another city, uh, say, oh, you, you're, you're too big for Ocala. You're getting too big for Ocala. No, Ocala is where God called us to be. I said it 32 years ago. I said it 15 years ago. I said it 15 minutes ago. This is where we're called to be. This is our base for life. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of churches have come and gone in 32 years around us, I'll prom I promise you. But our commitment is our commitment. This is our labor of love. We love you. We love being your pastors. Now, normally, we have... I love to give away gifts on all of our anniversaries and things. We have a gift for you, kind of. <laughs> so we have a gift for you that didn't arrive. If you do any business with anything online now, you know that that's a common thing. So next week on Mother's Day, you will have a promise. The team will be here. Uh, those of you that are newer, um, since the 25th anniversary of our church, the, the, our team has asked us and given us a one-month vacation in the whole month of May. So after we leave here today, <clears throat> we will see you in June. We want you to be here, but Pastor Lindsay will be leading, Pastor Chris will be preaching, Pastor Tristan will be preaching some. It's going to be a great month. We always go forward, but it enables us to kind of I think it strengthens our ministry for longer. You know, I, I think what we learned early on is that we're not good at resting. And we have to be, be um, very intentional about rest. I hope you're that way on your vacation this summer as well. <clears throat> but after these years, this one month means a lot. So next week, can we put that slide up? This is, um, this is your gift. This is a new chip clip with the legacy building. It's purple. It's Legacy Building Now Church. Every one of you gets that. Uh, you get a clip, and you get a clip, and you get a clip. <clears throat> and we hope that you enjoy it. I, 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 my regret is it didn't come in. It was supposed to be on Thursday, and here we are. So enjoy the pic picture. Isn't that a beautiful chip clip? Do you like your chip clip? Okay. <clears throat> anyway, those of you online, you have to be here to get one. And finally, before I preach the word, I got a little bit of news. As of Friday, after going through 13 departments of county building and zoning, this past Friday, after getting multiple people to approve, then sign for, then approve again, what should have taken a month or two has taken about four months. But as of Friday, we are approved for all building permits. We should have them this week. Praise God. We are we're moving forward, going under construction, and it is, uh, it's a joy, and uh, we will be in this building. I guess when my, I have a prophetic prediction. No man knows the day or the hour, <laughs> except the Son of Man. Anyway, so when we get in there, I'm still hoping to be in next year around Vision Sunday in February, but who knows? Whenever we're there, we're there. Hopefully by Easter for sure. Hopefully. But listen, I've always said this. The Bible says, imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. That means faith doesn't control time. Faith controls outcome. Why? Because it, you wouldn't need patience if faith controlled the time. So you have to sit back and wait on the Lord, be of good courage, wait, I say, on the Lord. Anyway, as we move forward, we begin a brand new theme this month. I get to kick it off for Heart for the House Sunday, Anniversary Sunday. We begin a new theme called Yesterday, Today, and Forever. Yesterday reminds me of the old Beatles song, Today reminds me of the Today Show. And forever reminds me of where we're going to spend eternity. Amen? Amen. Here's what we're going to do. <clears throat> Open your Bibles to Isaiah 60, beginning with verse 1. Arise and shine, for your light has come, 
and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth. Anybody notice that lately, by the way? Darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. The Gentiles, the unsaved people, shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Now this verse, uh, this is one of my life verses. I've been meditating on it, preaching on it for years and years. We're gonna look at it from a little different angle today. I wanna weave in the promise from Habakkuk chapter two, verse 14. This is still future, but this is what God is doing now. For the earth will be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. What kind of knowledge do we need of the glory of the Lord? Revelation knowledge, experiential knowledge, understanding and wisdom and application. Let's pray together one more time. Father God, we give you glory. Thank you for today. Thank you for this celebration from the humble beginnings to where we are now, this pivotal moment of construction. Lord, we know it's not about buildings. It's about your glory meeting and touching people. And we ask you to come and minister your word and your life to us in Jesus' name, amen. amen. If you've been around with us at all through COVID, you know my least favorite word in the world the last two years is the word uncertain. Uncertain, in this uncertain world. You hear it on the news? <clears throat> Pardon me, you hear it on commercials in these uncertain times. In this uncertain world, we have a savior who is called the rock of ages because he is solid, steady, dependable, loving, faithful, and his word is his bond. He's not moody. He doesn't change his mind. He doesn't take back his promise because he's mad at you one day. His love endures forever. Neither death nor life nor principalities nor powers nor height, nor depth, or any other created thing shall separate us from his love. It is constant. Hebrews 13, he said this way, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If Jesus did it in the Bible, he's always done it, and he still does. If he saved people from their sins 2,000 years ago, he's still saving people now. If he healed the sick back then, he still heals the sick today. And by the way, he did, he does, and he will. If Jesus set people free from demonic power and oppression 2,000 years ago, he absolutely still sets you and me free today up to this very moment right now. And I say you can be set free today before you leave this place if you came inbound. If Jesus blessed people, then he blesses them today. If he multiplied loaves and of bread and fillets of fish and gave food and provision to feed 5,000 then. He's still the bread of life today and he still multiplies today. Amen. If he provided gold in a fish's mouth for Peter and he to pay their taxes, he still provides today. How many of you know that's good news that God wants to pay your taxes? Amen. But you know what? You have to pay your taxes too. <laughs> Our God is a good, good father who always takes care of his family, his kids. I remember one time when we were going through a real time of financial challenge, studying, preparing for ministry. We got our faith walk time and we were really, we were living by miracles. Sometimes daily, sometimes weekly, but always monthly. We were living by miracles. And in that time, we began to discover certain things and, and there were moments where it looked like God wasn't coming through in time. And Lord gave me that scripture that there's this great scripture in the New Testament that says, if a man doesn't provide for his own family, he's worse than an infidel, worse than an unbeliever. And I was looking at that scripture. If a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. If he doesn't provide for his own family, he is worse than an unbeliever, and not worse than a Gentile. And I'm thinking like, well, God, what, is, what are you saying here? And, and finally, the Lord spoke to me out of his, I kind of meditated on that for a while, and the Lord spoke to my heart. He said, do you think I can ever not believe in myself? I said, no. 
He said, then if I'm your father, I cannot fail to provide for you. I can't fail. And so what looked to be late, still with God came out to be just in time. It just looked late. You know what I'm saying? God, I don't know why he likes the 11th hour or 1215. I don't know. The Bible says in, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit came at midnight. He could have come at 930 when we're all wide awake. He came at midnight. I don't know why, but late in the midnight hour, we used to sing a song. God's going to turn it around and around and around. Late in the midnight hour, I'm going to trust him because he's God and he's my father, he's your father, he cannot fail to provide for his own kids or even have to destroy himself. His word is true, it's his absolute bond. Now I wanna to talk to you today about something really near and dear to my heart. I'm gonna to talk to you about the glory of God. But we're gonna go extremely practical today. The word of God must be applied to our everyday life, so to me, this is a revelation we've been walking in for over 25 years. It was life-changing for us and for the church back in the late 90s when God spoke this word and gave it so clearly. And it's still in the fabric, even though I don't talk about it all the time, it's in the fabric of this church. We've shared recently a lot about God's power. God's power. Well, in Exodus 33, the Bible says that Moses and God were having conversations quote, like a man speaks to his friend. In other words, they're having up close and personal dialogue. Aren't you glad that God knows your name? Right. And that conversation between you and him is supposed to be personal. <clears throat> it's, it's not religious. It's not, thou great God, I fold my hand today and saith that thou art holy. No, Father, the Bible says, whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Some of the most anointed prayers in my life sometimes have been, help me, Jesus. Right? Jesus, your word says, if I call upon your name, I'm going to be set free from this situation. And you can't fail. Moses had this kind of relationship with God. He's on Mount Sinai. And the Lord expressed his frustration with Israel and he floats a new idea that he's not really, he's, God says, I don't feel like these people really want me. They're not listening. <clears throat> they're not obeying. And they, quite frankly, they're mad at you, Moses. So God says, here's my vow. I'm gonna fulfill my promise to take the people into the promised land and set them up for nice lives. But then my presence is gonna lift. And Moses argues with God. It's intercession. He starts to pray for the people. I mean, God said to Moses at one point, look, why don't we destroy these people and you and I start fresh? It won't be the Abrahamic covenant anymore than be the Mosaic covenant. And Moses said no, because God, you know what the world will say? That you weren't able to deliver your people. That you weren't able to provide for your own, that you weren't a father to them. Moses could have had a fresh start to be the, the, the we're the Moses people. But he turned it down because he was jealous for what people would say about God. And so Moses argues with God in Exodus 33 and says this, if your presence doesn't go up with us, we don't want to go to the promised land because your presence <clears throat> is more important than your promises. And then he takes it a step further in verse 18 of Exodus 33. Moses said to God, here's all I'm asking for. Please show me your glory. Show me your glory. God responded. It's really interesting. God, first of all, God says, well, I'm gonna, here's, I'll show you what I'm gonna do. I will answer that. But I'm gonna have to put you in the cleft of a little rock and I'm gonna have to pass by so you can see the back of me because if you look directly into my face, you'll die because it's too holy, it's too bright. The glory of God in, his, in the fullness of his face is so bright, it would not only blind you, God says it would kill you. 
But God says to Moses, but I'm gonna give it to, I'm gonna show you my glory in such a way that you can, that you can see it and look at it and feel it and get it and understand it. You can experience it, like I talked about last week. I'm gonna show you this and you can experience it, but I'm gonna have to walk by you first and put my hand over you so you don't get killed. So this conversation goes on <clears throat> and, and I didn't realize it because it, it, God says, okay, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna, let my, I'm gonna show you uh, my glory. I'm gonna show you my goodness, my mercy. I'm gonna show you the power of my name and I'm gonna show you my grace. But this week it came real to me when I looked a few verses later into the next chapter Exodus 34, verse five, and five through seven. So this is when God did it. So <clears throat> I've usually preached this message based on what God said he would do, what, his, what he would reveal of himself. But I wanna expand it because here's the fulfillment. <clears throat> God says, verse five, Exodus 34. Now the Lord descended in the cloud. So this is him answering the prayer and stood with Moses there and proclaim the name of the Lord. That's an element of his glory. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed. Now that's twice there. In the revelation of his glory, there's a proclamation of his power. Basically, he comes in and says, I'm God, here's my glory, I'm God. God does everything through a word. He proclaimed the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and truth, and keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. My friends, The elements of God's glory he lists here. You wanna see his glory? <clears throat> Excuse me. He said, I'm gonna show you my goodness, my grace, mercy, truth, and the power and authority of his name. These are his attributes. These are his essence. This is his nature. You wanna know what God is like? Exodus 34, verse five through seven. God says, okay. You want to manifest my presence, see the manifest presence, you want to experience me? Here it is. Here's my attributes. Now why am I sharing this? Because, <clears throat> pardon me, serving around several healing evangelists and prophetic leaders in my life, I've had the privilege of seeing many signs and wonders and miracles with my own eyes. I've seen amazing incredible and mind-blowing miracles. I've seen people dying with cancer change their color as the blood comes back into their body in health. <clears throat> I've seen cancers, skin cancers, on people's bodies fall off or disappear in front of my eyes. I've seen, I've seen broken legs instantly healed. I'll tell you one funny story. I don't have time to tell a bunch. <clears throat> I just remember this one. We were doing a week of, they called it Miracle Week. Back in, I don't know, 1987 or so, 88. And so they were having miracle service every night. So about Wednesday night of that week, this family comes in and, and Pastor Benny Hinn calls out a word of knowledge and said, there's someone here, you have a broken leg and God is healing you right now. <clears throat> he said, and he stopped the service, where are you? And this family brings this young high school teenage boy up to the front on crutches, bring him on the platform. And he's got a, he's got a broken, he's got a cast from his toes all the way up to his hip. So this is, a, this is a real break. So this guy turned out to be the quarterback of the Apopka Blue Darters 
high school football team. And it was during football season. And his father was a huge Alabama fan. Huge. They bring this kid up, and they bring up, and, and the pastor Benny Hinn says, bring him up here. He says, um, he says, sit down on the floor. So the guy sits on the floor. Pastor Benny comes and lifts up the guy's cast. It's all the way up to his hip. Lifts it up in the air. I thought the guy was going to break the other hip. <laughs> and Pastor Benny drops it. Like he lifts it up to here, and then boom. And this dust shoots out of his toes, and, and uh, the cast breaks. Now, I'm, I was newly in ministry and on staff, and I was trusting Jesus. <laughs> because I know we live in a litigious society. I know how it all works. I've seen the Morgan and Morgan commercials 10,000 times. And I'm thinking, boy, I hope he's anointed right now. I really... <laughs> I hope he really has this one, okay? <laughs> so, he, so he says, so get him up. Oh, Lord. So the, so the cast begins to break, and Pastor Benny goes, walk on it. Throw, he throws down the crutches, and he starts to walk like this, and he's, and he, you know, he's still got the cast on, but he said, uh, and he, Pastor Benny said, how much pain? He says, no pain. Somebody yells, yay. We didn't know if he had pain when he came up. We didn't know. <laughs> we had miracles at service every night. The next night was Thursday. That guy comes running in the room with x-rays from the day before and from the day after the prayer. <laughs> And that bone that had been in two was completely healed and whole. Now I'm just telling you, that's one, that's just one. So when I have, when, when Pastor Chris says we, we've seen miracles here, we've seen miracles here, okay, and there. And these are my point of reference. So if God can do that, why can't he do it for you? Why can't he heal your heart or your brain or, or your blood? We've seen it, okay, so, so the point is, but here's the deal, because of all these things, I used to have a very narrow view about the glory of God. The Old Testament showed the glory as a reverential awe of the holiness of God, an experience of, wow, God's here. A cloud by day, a fire by night. At times when the glory showed up in the Old Testament, thunder roared and lightning flashed and fire fell. In the New Testament, Jesus was transfigured in front of Peter, James, and John into the image of God's glory in such bright white light that they couldn't look. They had to bow and hide their eyes because they couldn't look at the brightness of his glory. My view of the glory of God as a young preacher was one-dimensional, spiritual. In healing or miracle services, we experienced the glory of God in so many ways. The thickness of his presence was overwhelming to believers. People were often slain in the spirit. They would feel overwhelmed and fall out, sometimes laying on the floor for a long time. Others felt heat touching them. There were different manifestations. We could sense the presence of God, but here's my problem. I'm a very practical meat and potatoes kind of guy, okay? I like to know if I get a revelation, what am I gonna do with it tomorrow? I don't need to be, uh, I don't need uh, just a brain infusion. I don't need a, what we used to call, we used to call them heavy revy. I don't need just heavy revy where I go, wow, look at what God showed me. Isn't that awesome? Okay, but how does it apply to your daily life? Because to me, if it's, that's meat and potatoes. That's where I'm right there. So, <clears throat> For years, I kind of looked at the glory in one way and felt the experience, felt the presence, was overwhelmed by that. But then when it came to one of my life verses, Isaiah 60, where we started today, arise and shine, for the glory of the Lord is risen, is risen upon you, God's people. 
It is risen upon you to the point that Gentiles, lost and broken unbelievers, will come to your light and kings, leaders, will be drawn to your brightness. For years, I meditated on this and I started wondering, what is it in the glory of God that is attractive to lost people? I know what we experience as believers when we sense the presence of God a few moments ago in worship. But the Bible doesn't just say that we get a goosebump and feel good. The Bible says unreached people will recognize something about the glory of God on you and on me. They'll see something. What is it? That's where, that's where this whole thing came from. Are you with me? So I said, what, is, what in the glory is attracted to lost people? I imagined what would happen if I were in the grocery store and the anointing of God came on me, walking down the cereal aisle, and the glory of God fell, and fire shot out of my hands and consumed the Rice Krispies. <laughs> and everybody on aisle six was slain in the spirit. And I ask you, is that appealing? to anybody. I don't think so. I, if you weren't saved and spirit-filled, you would probably, you, you probably wouldn't say, wow, God must be real. You would probably run the other way and think I was a nut. <laughs> right? But my conclusion is this. The glory of God has a magnetic attraction it may make an unsaved person a little bit uncomfortable with the unfamiliar, but it's still irresistible. It's irresistibly attractive. Remember the first time I saw dancing in church after we got filled with the Holy Spirit? I've been honest with you. We were raised, uh, my wife was raised Baptist. I was raised Presbyterian. And we didn't see a whole lot of dancing in our churches. Let's just say that. We didn't, we didn't hear a lot of hallelujahs even. The first time I saw dancing in a spirit-filled church, it freaked me out because of my tradition. But then I saw it in the Bible. I saw David dancing with all of his might in the word of God and being unapologetic and his wife that looked out the window and despised him, she paid a price for mocking him about dancing. But still I was nervous. I had just reached a point where I could lift my hands comfortably. And they said, lift your hands. You know, I started out, you know, I started out the, you know. The... <laughs> you know, people do. And some of you today, maybe when Pastor Chris said, let's lift our hands, or Pastor Lynn said, let's lift our hands. You just go, um, um, I haven't seen that. I'm comfortable with that. So, you know, give a, you know just a patronizing Woo. You know? But I had just reached a point in my walk down in those Benny Hinn days where I was, in the early days, especially before I was in ministry, <clears throat> I was just serving. And I, I was just reached a comfort level to actually lift my hands in the presence of God and people and say, Lord, I surrender. I worship you. I got no hidden agenda. There's nothing up my sleeve. I'm just here to give you my life afresh. But the dancing thing still freaked me out. And then one morning, my wife and I were on the front row, our kids were in children's church. We were in the front row of that church. <clears throat> and I still hadn't ever danced before the Lord, even though a lot of people jumped and moved kind of like we do here. I was up in the front row because I wanted to be close to the presence of God. That's what I felt. I want to be close to the presence of God. And I felt this inner nudge from the Holy Spirit that day say, I want you to dance before the Lord in praise today. And first I ignored it. Then I resisted it. Then I rebuked it. <laughs> I thought it must be the devil. But then it didn't make sense. Why would the devil want me to dance before God? And I knew my flesh wasn't telling me to do it. 
Your flesh isn't gonna tell you to sacrifice anything to the Lord or you know, do something embarrassing. <clears throat> so I came to the conclusion, must be God. And still I wrestled. And I did what faith-filled people do. I asked for confirmation. <laughs> and about the time, and this is all internal, you know, I didn't tell my wife what was going on. She didn't tell me. People around us were doing, back then it was the, like in the, in the spirit-filled churches, there was a, I called it a Pentecostal bop. It was kind of like a dance. You kind of dance like this, you know. <laughs> woo, 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 T-berry shuffle, you know, like this. And that was, the, that was the dance back then. And so people in the front row around us were doing like this. And I'm like, whoa, I would never do that, you know. <laughs> <clears throat> but here I'm having this internal conflict. And I said, I said, okay, Lord, I'll dance before you, but I need confirmation. Now, Pastor Benny used to, We'd start the services real high, and then he would walk out when he kind of felt the, the, the Spirit of God moving in, about the first or second song. He'd, he'd come, there was a door back here from his office, came around on the platform. So I'm on the front row, and I'm saying, all right, Lord, I'll dance. Give me confirmation. About that time, the door swings wide open, and Pastor Minnie walks out. Those of you who don't know him, you don't know this, but he kind of walk. He, he kind of walk like this. He kind of... <laughs> He'd kind of float out, okay? So he comes out, and he comes out the door. He did something he never did before or after. He said, I feel the spirit of dancing in this place today. <laughs> and I'm like, oh boy. <laughs> I think I lifted one foot and hopped and, <laughs> woo. But you know, after those first few steps, I just kind of felt chains fall off. I felt like traditions. Like, I felt like Presbyterian chains falling off my feet, you know? I felt like, I'm not putting the Presbyterians down, I'm just saying, we, we, we were called the frozen chosen. That's what, we, that's what the Presbyterians are called. We called ourselves, as Presbyterians, the, fro, pro, the frozen chosen because we were the chosen people of God, predestined and sovereignly chosen by God to be the frozen chosen. And here I was that day, and, and here, and I, I mean, I started, <laughs> I mean, I, whatever, but whatever happened, I'm telling you, my life changed. Amen. The presence of God fell. My wife, who looked at me like I had lost my ever-loving mind, began, she, she took off her shoes, started dancing next to me, like, let's, okay, we're gonna dance. And it changed my life. I felt like heaven opened over our lives in a brand new way. I felt the glory of God. But what do lost people see in our lives as Christ followers? What is the, what is the relatable glory? What is something that they can see? I used to preach a message called Show Your Scars. Some of you have heard it. Some people like Thomas, who we call in traditional Christianity, we call him Doubting Thomas. You know that's not in the Bible. Jesus never called him Doubting Thomas. When Thomas said, I will not believe unless I can touch his scars and put my hand in his side, the next time Jesus comes in through the wall and comes into the upper room, he says, where's Thomas? And he didn't rebuke him. He said, Thomas, come here. Look at my hands. Look at my feet. Give me your hand. Put it in the wound in my side. Why? Because there are some people who will only be convinced of the reality of Jesus when they see your scars of what you've survived, that you've been through something and that God healed you up. What is a scar? It's a wound, but it's healed. But you can see where the wound was. There are some people, why do we go through such 
difficult times as believers sometimes because there are moments where life is tough, but when you get through it, your faith is actually stronger because you trust God more. He did come through. He did take care of you. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same. Some people will only be convinced of God by seeing what you've gone through and survived. But I learned a long time ago, and this is where we're gonna land in a few moments. Other people will only be drawn to the Lord by seeing his goodness and favor moving in your life right now. His goodness, his mercy. You wanna see the glory of God? You wanna see and experience the glory of God outside of church? It's not very, very often, it's not very often a goosebumpy moment. It's a moment where his goodness chases you down. His goodness is running after me. You saying it? Surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever. His goodness and his mercy are elements of his glory. This came true, you know, I, I came home to me when I talked to a lady that was in Benny Hinn's church years ago. Her name was Lillian, I forget her last name. She was a formerly a Jewish woman who had gotten saved. She'd given her life to Yeshua. She'd come to know Jesus as Lord. And she's, her, they called her Diamond Lil. She was a restaurant owner, wealthy lady in Orlando. And I had a conversation with her several times. And one time she told me, she said, you know, I had a lot of people come to me at restaurants that I own and try to tell me about Jesus. She said, but they were always talking about poverty in relationship to, relation with, to, to knowing Jesus. She said, then I heard Kenneth Copeland. She said, Kenneth Copeland was the first person I ever heard that it resonated with me because she said, we know as Jews the blessing of God. Everybody who went to serve God in the Old Testament became very blessed and they were unapologetic about it. You read the, you read the story of Abraham and you find that Abraham left the land with nothing or not much and taking care of his nephew and wound up it says, and he worshiped God. And then right after it says he worshiped God, it says, and he became very rich with livestock. Now, I'm not preaching avarice here. Please don't shut me down. Let me get to the end of this, but I want you to understand, this is not about materialism. This is about abundant life. This is about John 10, 10 life. The devil's come to steal. What? What does he steal? Resources. The devil's going to steal from you and kill and destroy. But Jesus said, I have come to give my people life in super abundance till it overflows. Abundant life. Abundant life includes God's goodness and grace and unmerited favor and mercy in every area of your life. Everything you will ever need is contained in the glory of God. I'm telling you to pursue the glory of his name and the glory of his presence and keep your eyes on the giver. Here's the mistake. Once we start getting prayers answered and get in a new cycle of blessing and abundance, we take our eyes off of the giver and onto the gift. Then we start trusting us, ourselves, our innovation, our our ingenuity. Look how I'm doing. The Bible says, be careful when you come into your promised land that you don't forget. It says, remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth. Wealth, wealth. Some of you are afraid of that word because you, your, your point of reference is people that have done something stupid with excess and materialism. I'm not preaching that. I'm saying when you focus on the glory of God, everything you need is in that presence. Everything you need in your marriage is in that presence. When skeptical sinners see how good God is to you, how your heavenly father takes care of you, they will listen to you in a different way. It's about influence. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes, there was a poor man who delivered a city, but nobody listened to that poor man because he was poor. He had no influence. He, he was a warrior, but nobody listened to him because he didn't have anything. 
My friends, we've been taught that humility equals poverty. How can humility equal poverty where God is? Isn't God the holiest of all? We're in God's presence that he uses gold for pavement, not jewelry, streets of gold. I guarantee you, if we, if we paved out here after the new building's done with gold, people would say, oh, these people are crazy. What are they doing? They're wasting, they're wasting. God sees gold as pavement. Why? Because where he is, there is abundance of everything good. I gotta, I gotta finish, I gotta finish. My friends, God wants to bless you to empower your witness. Our privilege as believers is to access the glory of God, the tangible manifested presence of Jesus that contains all of his attributes, his supernatural power and radiant light. But here's the, here's the bottom line. There's no glory manifested in your life or mine without true worship. There is no worship without genuine sacrifice. And there's no sacrifice without it costing you something valuable. <clears throat> That's the truth. We've done a disservice to the next generations by trying to tell them that if they serve Jesus, everything will come easy. It's not true. Every player gets a trophy. Yuck. It's not true in life. Ask world-class athletes. If they became great at what they do because they were just so gifted at it. I'll tell you, it was hard work. Sacrifice has a price. The greater the sacrifice, the greater the glory. I've said it for years. I've been fasting my whole life from broccoli. <clears throat> I've been fasting completely. I've, I've, been, I've gone cold turkey. In fact, I even like cold turkey better than broccoli. All my life, I've been fasting broccoli. Lord, unto you. But you know how God receives that as a sacrifice? Nope. Why? Because I don't love broccoli. I can't stand broccoli. I detest broccoli. I wish it was never invented. I don't like the smell. I don't like the presentation. I don't like the way it looks. It's offensive to me. It's not a sacrifice. Now dark chocolate. We got an issue. When God says, okay, I want you to give up dark chocolate for three days. Okay. Receive my sacrifice, Lord. The tears of my sacrifice. My friends, the greater the sacrifice, the greater the glory. Romans 8 says the sufferings of this present night are sacrifices of this present night and nothing can bear the glory shall be revealed in us. Elijah called down the fire from heaven in 1 Kings, but hidden in the story is that he poured out 12 barrels of water onto the sacrificial bull in a drought. What's the most precious thing in a drought? Water, not bulls. The secret was the real sacrifice. David reestablished the order in his kingdom from a deadly plague and offered a huge sacrifice to the Lord. When the farmer heard, he offered to give everything for free. We all like free stuff, don't we? Don't you like free stuff? And David said, no. First, First Chronicles 21, we'll, we'll land right here. Then King David said to Ornan, no, but I will surely buy it for the full price. And Ornan said, don't call me Shirley. No, that's what he said. It's my old, my, my old joke. For I will not, this is what David said, I will surely buy it for the full price. Wait, when's the last time somebody said, I want to pay full price for that? No, no, you get a discount. No, I don't want a discount. <laughs> David said, I will not take what is yours for the Lord, nor offer burnt offerings with that which costs me nothing. I can't give your stuff to God and call it a sacrifice for me. It's got to pinch me to be a sacrifice. My friends, the takeaway is this. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today 
and forever. If you want his presence in your life, you can't just keep going with the flow. You've got to surrender. You've got to be willing to dance. You've got to be willing for the quiet people. You've got to be willing to speak up. For the loud people, you've got to be willing to be quiet. We all have a sacrifice. And God knows whether it's really a sacrifice or not. God always meets us at our point of sacrifice. In just a moment, we're gonna have our Heart for the House offering. We do this once a year. This is only for now church people that have a revelation of this. We're not asking you to give if you're not part of this family, part of this house. <clears throat> but we're saying for those of you that are part of it, whether you're here or whether you're here, watching, this is a holy moment. This is not a fundraiser for the church. This is about your needs on your way in the door or last week when you were leaving, you were given a prayer card. Can I get a prayer card up here? You were given a prayer card. Can I have that up here? Thank you. You were given one of these prayer cards a week ago or today on the, on the way in, hopefully. We ask you to put down the most pressing thing in your life that as your pastors, we can lay hands on this today and pray, but we begin a prayer campaign. We're gonna be praying for these prayer requests as your pastors for the whole month of May. And we're believing for breakthroughs. We've, we just, last year we did videos and I just saw some more online the other day. I was so touched by people that said, giving testimonies, what they were believing God to do. Certain things look impossible, but trusting God. Ushers, would you get up? We're gonna, we're, we're gonna ask you to put up, where's the uh, basket? Do we have the basket? <clears throat> Bring, thank you. Thank you, sir. Mr. Brooks, let's do that right there. We're gonna ask you to come up. Listen, you don't have to put your name. God knows your name. You don't have to put your name on these cards. These are anonymous, or you can put it on there if you want to. But anything sensitive, just, just fill it out. No, nobody has to know. We don't, we don't need to know as your pastors what you're praying for. But fill out your prayer request, get it in this basket. We're gonna give you a moment at the end right now to, to fill these out, we're gonna ask you to bring them up in a moment. And we're gonna ask you to put your best offering, whatever is a sacrifice for you, right here on this platform, just on the stage, wherever you wanna be, sow a seed. My wife and I, we prayed about it all week and then yesterday we came to agreement. <clears throat> she said, do you have an, I said, how much do you feel to give this year? It's always a pinch for us. And I said, how much do you feel to give? She said, well, I, I don't really have a, do you have a number? I said, no, I have a range. I said, I have kind of a range. I, and I didn't tell her the range. Then she gave me the number and it was in the range. It's okay, God. So be in agreement. So this is whatever is a sacrifice. Listen, the widow's might, she gave two pennies and the Bible said, Jesus said she gave more than everybody else because it was everything she had. To some of you, $1,000 would be a huge sacrifice. To some of you, it'd be, it'd be nothing. <clears throat> to other people, your number is 100 or 10,000. The number is not my, th th this is not a fundraiser. This is, let's, let's seek the glory. Let's release our faith. Let's put our prayer report re request in and let's believe God for healings and miracles and breakthrough and his glory, his goodness to be seen on us, not just when we're at church, but his glory to be on us when we're buying groceries <clears throat> or sitting in a doctor's office or going to the dentist or just going to work. So I wanna, we're gonna have you come up right now. We're gonna have you put this here, like I said, we're not asking anybody to do anything you're uncomfortable with. This is for people that have a revelation of this. That's the only way it works. So right now, we're gonna pray at the end. So right now, I invite you to come right now, bring your offering, put it on the platform, on the stage, anywhere. Ushers will get it. And your prayer request in the basket right there. Surrender, we fall down, sing and sing. Show us your glory. Show us your love. Let every, let every burning heart be holy. Show us your glory as we say. Show us your glory. 
Bible says, steep your life in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. Don't worry about missing out. You'll find all your everyday human concerns will be met. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first his glory. I'm not telling you as your pastor, seek materialism. I'm saying the opposite. I'm saying seek his glory. The Old Testament definition of glory, the, one of the words is uh, is uh, Chabad, Chabad. Another word is Shekinah. Those words literally mean thickness or heaviness with everything that is good. That's what we want for your life, for you to be heavy with everything that is good. Would you, can I get the other pastors to come up? Here, we'll do it right over here. Pastor Chris, come over here. Let's bring it by PL. He's got to play with one hand and pray with the other. Okay. Just grab it right there. Just grab that basket. <clears throat> Father, in the name of Jesus, you see the sacrifice of your people and you see the cries of their heart. We ask you to do miracles. We ask you to heal broken bones and broken lives. We ask you to heal broken marriages and broken finances. We ask you to bring dreams into realities. We thank you for new homes and new cars. We thank you that you care. Anything we care about, you said you care about it. We thank you for blessing our children and our grandchildren. <clears throat> the next generation would experience your presence and power and your glory even greater. Lord, let them not know the the garbage that we've all gone through when we were younger, but let them walk in a new season. Let them walk in a new path. Let the, let the trail be blazed. We break generational curses and tendencies. And we ask you, Lord, to show your glory on every heart, on every request. We pray for the people at home right now, Father. We pray for everyone watching right now that couldn't be here this morning. We pray for you to do what only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now listen, we're going to be praying over these. Everybody stand up on your feet. We're going to keep praying over these. If you did not get to put something in you wanted to, still send out a prayer card. Do that right now. Sorry to go so long, but this is our anniversary. We had a few extra stories today. Let's lift our hands right now. <clears throat> in the presence of God. And I'm not even gonna tell you to dance right now. I'm just gonna tell you, lift your hands. Lord, thank you for these 32 years. Would you covenant with us for at least 32 more? Would you come Holy Spirit and move in your way and show us your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Give him praise right now. Come on and praise the Lord. Praise him. Praise God. Thank God. Hey, quickly before you go, I've got three short announcements for you. One is, if you are newer to Now Church tonight, at 5 o'clock we have liftoff. Liftoff is going to be about a one-hour class gathering together for those just that are newer to the Now Church to connect with God for one and connect with the church. So that's going to be 5 o'clock right here. Don't miss it. Liftoff for those of you that are newer. Also, uh, this Wednesday we're going to have church-wide prayer happening at 7 o'clock. All of us getting together 
together to pray, and it's going to be a great way to kick off the rest of the month as well, too, 7 o'clock. And also, we have a now youth event, Nacho Night. It's going to be this Thursday on May 5th, Cinco de Mayo. Everyone loves nachos, right? And so that's going to be taking place at 7 p.m. Bring $4 in friends. Parents, it's Nacho Night. <laughs> it's you. You're welcome. All right, be blessed. We will see you. Thanks for joining us at Now Church. For the latest updates, visit us at nowchurch.com, including live or on-demand video, event registration, online giving, and much more. And don't forget to follow Now Church on our social media platforms, including Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And please use the hashtag NowChurch. Thank you, 